Before we begin, I wanted to give a huge shout out to the folks at Amazon Music for partnering with us on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. But more on this later. Right then, let's get right into today's episode. And we're so grateful to have you as well, Peter, for this particular episode. Thank you so much for taking out the time to join us on the podcast. And this weekend, we're talking Suzuka because, of course, Formula One returns here after an entire year. And what a circuit this is. Particularly, I can imagine it must be for you as well, because you must have had so many memories of this place, right? Because if my if my reading serves me correctly, I think you were there back when it was Williams Honda also, right? back in Suzuka was that the case as well that's right 87 uh it was it was rather strange for the Japanese for the Honda people because we I was at Williams at the time and we've been running engines since what 84 started winning in 85 86 the there was no Japanese Grand Prix so they still in Japan they hadn't actually heard the real sound of the Honda engine in the back of a Williams it was kind of a weird thing and when we got there uh, eventually we, we uh, before that race in 87, we went to the Toshigi test track and Wako in, in Tokyo, the Honda facilities, and did some demos. That's when Nigel did the first ever donut, actually, in, outside the factory in Wako, with everybody standing in white coats. It must have been 2,000 Honda employees just standing there, and Nigel was in the FW11. Uh, and uh, they, they just thought he was going to do a sort of short acceleration run. They're going to hear the sound of the engine, and he just floored the throttle with full left lock and did the first ever donut and just scattered the 2,000 people into all four corners of the globe, basically. And then, yeah, of course, uh, then then eventually we had a Japanese Grand Prix. So it's kind of strange to think that Honda were winning world championships and Grand Prix before they actually had the Japanese Grand Prix uh, at Suzuka at that point of Formula One history. And, and yeah, it says a lot about Honda, really, how committed they are to racing. And, of course, that track, Suzuka track, was created by Honda. And to their credit, they got John Hugenholtz, the Dutch designer, architect, to create the circuit based on the work he'd done at Zandvoort. And he came out with that wonderful figure eight circuit, which still lives today. When I first saw that circuit as a kid, I was blown away about how a figure of eight could actually happen. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you folks when you first walked into that place and saw it in all of its grandeur, the curves, the way it just loops around itself and the corners. What was your first impression of Suzuka actually like, Peter? Well, being a scale extra kid and growing up with scale electric <laughs> my first scale electric track was a figure eight. I was kind of excited to see Suzuka. That figure eight actually exists, as you say. Yeah, you know, I did actually go to look at the the bridge pretty quickly and the superstructure around there to see how they'd done it. And I was very impressed, as, as ever you would be, with with Hugenholtz Japanese Honda joint construction. And it was that, and it was all the vantage points. And we walked around the circuit immediately and to look down on the S's as they're coming up the hill towards the, the Dunlop curve and then... Degner's, yeah, I just drank it all in. And it, of course, it isn't just the track there as well. It was the entire uh, infrastructure of the hotel, the Suzuka Circuit Hotel, and everything around that, and all the, the, the all the all the activities you can do if you're a racing fan or if you're just coming with your family. I mean, the only thing about Suzuka, it's quite difficult to get to then and <laughs> and still is today. If you, uh, in terms of traffic and small roads and everything else, but it's a nice walk from the nearby Yokaichi station and so forth. So, no, we just loved it. We just loved it from day one. And of course, we were quite privileged because Honda looked after us pretty well and we were in nice rooms in the Suzuka Circuit Hotel. And we ate in the nice restaurant, went to the log cabin afterwards and had a drink. And it was just, yeah, great times. What were the fans like, though, back in the past? From from what we see today, they are the most insanely passionate fans across the globe, especially with the hats, with the caps and all the sorts of fun demonstrations that they have. But were they somewhat similar back in the past as well, when the Japanese Grand Prix first rolled around to Suzuka? Oh, yeah, they were. They, uh, and it's part of Japanese nature. Very polite, very civil, very humble uh, and very patient. And everything was neat and tidy. And when a 
a child or even an adult has taken the trouble to frame a photograph and put it in its context, a driver usually, if it's a normal person, isn't going to have a problem taking a bit of time signing that. And that was the case with the Japanese, that everything was detailed and passionate, as you say. I think we have this impression that they're even more passionate than, than we. It's just that they do things differently. I like the way they do it. One of the things that struck me very early on with the pictures that the organizers have put up in the tunnel where you walk through mm -hmm. if you're a pedestrian uh, arrival at the circuit and, and the pictures of the drivers and the great moments in Honda history and so forth. And at any other circuit in the world, after four days, three and a half days of, of the crowd going in and out, they would have been either stolen or defaced or something. But by Sunday night, they're all still there, absolutely perfect. And 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 that I think that says a lot about about the Japanese culture. And the other thing, of course, is that when it's when the weather's not good and, and the cars aren't out on track and there's a bit of a delay, they just sit there patiently in the grandstand and even in the pouring rain. And that yeah, I always feel a bit sorry for them, really. But, you know, then, then you feel like going out and perhaps putting on some sort of show for them. And I think the Formula One teams in general always feel that way if the weather's a bit off. So, yeah, I think everybody loves going there. It's the detail and it's, it's, the, it's the attention to detail and it's the... Dare I say it, it's the politeness of the of the culture. Well, there was one word that you mentioned there that I'd love to pick up on, rain. And rain is a condition where the champions really do well. The likes of Vettel, Alonso, Schumacher, Senna, Hamilton, you name it. And these are the sorts of people who have actually done so well at Suzuka. Why do you think that's the case? Why have all the champions particularly excelled at this one circuit? And we should add Damon Hill to that, yeah, that classic true. win of Damon's. Um, well, I think <clears throat> I think if you, if you think of I mean, Suzuka is a very demanding circuit. I'm not saying that if you've got a terrible car and a great driver, that great great driver is going to put it on the front row because this circuit is a driver's circuit. Obviously, th there is a certain amount required by the car, and there's some long straights at Suzuka. You shouldn't forget that. That's probably why Red Bull will go really well this weekend uh, because they're good at everything else and they've got a top speed advantage. But it, it is a circuit where you've got to get the S's. You've got to get turns 1A and 1B, as I always call them, perfect. You've got to, and, and coming out of B, you've got to get the entry to the S's perfect. And then, of course, you've got to be really good through the S's in terms of change of direction. Then you've got to be really good in terms of short corners going through Dunlop and going into Degna, where there's always understeer. The track falls away, and you've got to be very good at balancing the car going into Degna 1. And then and tech Degna. If you get that right, Degna two should happen. But usually, when you see drivers running out of road at Degna two, it's because they've got one wrong. And then there's the Eddie Irvine kink, which nobody else has ever had a problem with, but where he had that massive crash in '99, I think, because he'd been at a nightclub the night before, <laughs> or something in to Tokyo. Um, then the hairpin. I mean, all I'm saying is, there's some lots of really intricate things you can do at Suzuka. So if you then add the wet to that. It means that not only have you got to do all those things well, but you've got to find where the grip is on all of those places as well. And that's that's all touch and feel and 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 just maximizing the car. Once where you know where the grip is, you've still got to do what the basic fundamentals of turns 1A and 1B require, but you might be doing it half a car length to the left of where you would normally be in the dry. And that's it's the same thing in terms of touch and feel. So it just adds another component. You can't be quick in the wet at Suzuka unless you're pretty good there in the dry, I think is the easy thing to say. And if you are good in the dry, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good in the wet. But if you have that touch and feel that comes with the great drivers, then you will be. And it rewards, it rewards that. It rewards sensitivity and suppleness rather than aggressive uh, moments that require great car control from which to recover. Everything needs to be quite fingertippy at Suzuka. Let's be honest, Peter. You must have wished that you would have a lap there, right? I mean, surely that 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 thought must have crossed your mind as well. Did you get the chance to ever drive there? Uh, I think I've driven round in a yeah in a road car when we were there in eighty. I think we did we go there in eighty six. Yeah, we did go there in eighty six and did some demos. And I think then I did I did some road. Uh, yeah, I went round in a road car. I mean, it didn't mean much because. I wasn't going very quickly and I wasn't trying to go quickly. 
Um, unlike Ron Dennis, who went off in his McLaren F1, didn't he? Road car when he was demoing that and went off at turn one, I think. Um, no, I, but no, it was fabulous. You know, I, I love going up the S's there. I mean, that to me is, is what racing is all about. That sort of waltz that you can get into, that rhythm of change of direction. And if you've got, as I say, if you get into the first part of the S's correctly, the rest of it kind of happens. And it's a bit like Beckett's at Silverstone. And well, it's a shame we don't have more corners like that. Yeah. But isn't it funny how heading into such a beautiful circuit, the biggest story of the entire Formula One weekend isn't even Formula One. It's actually the Formula One owners buying out MotoGP. And I find it to be a really exciting time because through my experiences last year at the Indian Grand Prix where I was commentating, I was literally feeling the need of a promoter who could do a lot more in terms of the marketing. And Liberty Media is someone who does exactly that. And I particularly wanted to know your take on this, Peter, about a Formula One MotoGP synchronization of sorts with the brands working together do you think that's a possibility i mean there have been wild ideas like a common race weekend floating around the paddock that's that's a bit ostentatious is it not well i, I have to say i'm not a moto gp guy i don't really understand it there's too much overtaking the racing's too close it's too much for me <laughs> um yeah the, the bikes are quite small for the width of the track if you get what i mean so i'm, I'm not a fan I'm, it's not that i'm not a fan i just have no knowledge of it all I can say is that I can't imagine that they would share the same weekend because the, what they need from the racetrack in terms of runoff area and curbs are completely different, I would imagine. And, I, and, and whenever we've had an issue in Formula One about curbs, the answer has usually been, oh, well, they're there because of MotoGP. And, and everybody's saying, well, let's get away. We're not MotoGP. We need to get away from this. So I'd be surprised if Liberty tried to put them on at the same weekend, I just, unless they do some sort of but create some purpose-built track in the middle of nowhere where you can overnight change the spec of the track or something, which is doesn't sound like the sort of thing Liberty would do. They're more into street races these days if they're going to spend money on things like that. So I don't see that. I mean, I'm sure MotoGP will benefit from being owned by a company like Liberty Media. If you look at a lot of the stuff they've done in Formula One, it's been very different from how Formula One was in the past. Mind you, it was a pretty low bar because Formula One in the past was Bernie Eccleston's Formula One. And although Bernie did a million great things, uh, he wasn't really interested in the internet and he wasn't really interested in the, the past, the history of Formula One. And, and, and Liberty have done quite a lot in both those areas. As I say, not a particularly difficult thing to do because it hadn't been done before. But otherwise... Yeah, they'll just be owned by Liberty. And I, to me, it's not a massive story because, you know, I'm, I think you ask why I'm not into MotoGP. I mean, yeah, they're bikes and stuff. But for me, downhill skiing is much closer to Formula One's uh, skill set than MotoGP. And, and indeed, rallying is, mm. I think. So I'd be, I'm more into rallying than I am in Formula One. I'd love to see Liberty Media buy the World Rally Championship. Now, that really would be good because at the moment, I think it's a bit lost. And that I'd love to see that. I agree with you. That, that would be the coolest thing in the world. But let's also move back to talk about the 2024 F1 season because there's been so much chaos off the track that we somewhat tend to forget what happens on it. But let's actually start off by talking about Red Bull Racing. And I particularly really wanted to know your take on this because it sort of gets masked in the results. But nobody's really noticing Sergio Perez a lot this year. And that may be a good or a bad thing. Do you think Sergio is doing anything different this year? Or is he having a better 2024 than he had a 2023, for instance? Like, do you think he's on the right track in terms of performance? Yeah, I think Sergio has driven pretty well. I, I don't think he drove very well in, in, in Australia, to be honest. But I think in, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, he did exactly what he should should do in that team. A very good backup job to Max. And had Max had a problem, he would have won the races quite clearly. So that's all you can expect of the guy in the other car at Red Bull if Max is in the, uh, the number one car or the prime car, let's put it that way. Australia, I was disappointed with him, partly... Yes, they shouldn't have allowed that to happen. It may not have been his fault in Q1 with the uh, impeding of Nico Hulkenberg, but he got that three-place grid penalty. But having said that, I still think he should have beaten the McLarens at, around around uh, Albert Park in a Red Bull RB20. It was a quick car, no doubt, and he didn't. And I, th I felt it was a bit of a flat race from Perez. He will talk about the tyres not being particularly good. He didn't get the hard tyres to work that well. But, you know, that's part of the job. You know, you should be getting them to work well in, in a car that's that good. 
I suppose you have to see that under the heading of the nature of Albert Park. It's not a circuit where Red Bull's greatest strength against Ferrari could show up. As I said early, earlier, I think that's top speed now. I don't think there's a, that much between them in terms of the way they can manage the tyres, the sweet spot they have for managing the tyres. Ferrari done a good job there. I think in terms of overall aero efficiency, Red Bull's well ahead, which is why they have a top speed advantage. But that top speed advantage didn't really show up or couldn't show up around Albert Park because there aren't really long straights there. So in that sense, I suppose you could say in a race where Perez had a three-place grid penalty, he was on a circuit where he didn't have the advantage that normally you would have with a Red Bull RB20. So maybe I'm being unfair there, but I, I still think we could have seen a bit more from him in that race. But it's only one race. And I think overall, yeah, I think he's doing a very good job. I haven't changed my interest in him or interest disinterest in him. I think he's just done a very good job and really there's no reason to replace him. People are saying, oh, well, you know, Carlos Sainz. Yeah, I mean, obviously we'd love to see Carlos in a decent car. He deserves it. But would Carlos really want to spend one year driving alongside Max Verstappen, let alone three years? You know, it's not going to be a great life for him there. So Sergio is actually a pretty good guy to have in that other car. Very interesting how you just ended this point, Peter, because you brought in Carlos Sainz and you know, there's this whole talk of will Max move to Mercedes if the whole power struggle plays out the, in a way that he doesn't expect it to and so on and so on. But we don't know what the power struggle is eventually going to lead us to or if it's actually ended, even though Christian Horner is saying it's time to move on. The big question is, has the power struggle or will the power struggle actually force Red Bull to plan for Max Verstappen's succession? just in case he just gets up one day and says, I'm leaving? Uh, not really, no. I think the only key person at Red Bull is Adrian Newey. And whether Max stays or not is kind of irrelevant so long as they have Adrian Newey. And I can't imagine that Max will leave so long as Adrian Newey is there. So I think everybody's kind of got it around the wrong way. They should be talking about, is Adrian in any way affected by any of this stuff that's been going on behind the scenes? Yes, he's going to leave. Wow, that's a big thing. If Adrian's going to leave, where's he going to go? That's where Max will go for sure. And equally, is he going to retire and just pull out of Formula One? In which case, it's a whole new clean sheet of paper for everybody. Personally, I think Adrian will stay and I don't think much will change. And I think Max will, if, if Adrian's at Red Bull, I think Max will stay. And there's only one Adrian Newey, and there's more than one Max Verstappen. There's a guy called Lewis Hamilton. There's a guy called Charles Leclerc. And there's a few new ones coming along. Oscar Piastri, good example. So uh, if, if Red Bull keep Adrian Newey and he signs a new three or four-year contract and Max says, I'm out of here, I've had enough, well, I don't think they'll be that worried. They'll just say, right, you know, we'll get the next big star. And Adrian Newey is good enough to win us world championships without Max Verstappen. And I believe he is, you know, as we've seen in the past. He won them a lot with, with, with Sebastian Bettel. So there you go. This reminds me of Bernie Eccleston's classic quote. The easiest to replace in a car is the driver. Clearly speaking, that's what Red Bull or any team over the years, it was Max, sorry, it was Michael Schumacher, Ferrari could replace. It's going to be uh, Lewis Hamilton that Mercedes is going to be looking to replace. So why not the same for Red Bull Racing? They'll they'll figure where the next superstar is coming. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Bernie said that. But of course, the reality is I'm, I'm saying it. If you have Adrian Newey, that's a big difference. Uh, if you take Haas as a good example, they don't have Adrian Newey. They have a pretty good team now of engineers, people on the ground. Delara have always been good. They've got some Ferrari technology there. But they need, because of way, who they are, how they are, how the team's put together, the budget, everything else, they need the two best drivers they can get. And they've done a good job there. And you can see how having two quick drivers who know how to finish a race, Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hulkenberg, you can see how big a difference that does make over other teams which don't have the same quality over the two drivers. And drivers do make a big difference. So in that sense, Bernie's wrong. I don't think Haas could just put anybody in and get the same results. But he's correct. If you have a team like Red Bull with Adrian Newey, 60% of the job is done, if not 70%. Yes, of course, it's nice to have the best driver in the world, then maximize everything you have and destroy the opposition forevermore. But even if you don't, you've still got a pretty good chance of winning the championship, as Red Bull have proven. I mean, Sebastian Vettel quite clearly is not as good a driver as Max Verstappen. 
and yet they won four world championships with Vettel. That just shows how good the team is and how good Adrian is. That makes me want to dig deeper upon the qualities of these drivers and how many Max Verstappens can we find on the grid. And what's your take on this whole affair, Peter? How many world championship level drivers do you think we have on the grid today? And would you rate someone like Lando Norris as a world champion material driver as well? I think as you look at it at the moment, Oscar Piastri definitely has more potential than Lando Norris. He, he's, the way he, he takes corners is more efficient. He's, he's more clinical. He's what I would call a short corner driver. He gets into the corner earlier. He does a lot of mid-corner manipulation with his hands. And particularly with his footwork, which we never see on camera, but he's got phenomenal footwork, Oscar Piastri. And he's a very self-critical athlete, let alone racing driver, which is a very good sign. He's always looking at other drivers, seeing if he can learn from them. I think Lando is very, very good, but he's kind of at a peak that he's not going to be able to improve upon other than just with normal experience unless he becomes more self-critical. I think he thinks there's only one way of taking a corner and that's the way he takes it. And I'm, I'm not sure if you were to talk to Lando that he would know why Oscar Piastri relatively often is as quick, if not quicker than he is. He wouldn't really have an explanation for it other than to say, well, he just got a good run or his car setup was better or something like that, or he, Lando, made a mistake. And, and there is a fundamental difference in the technique they use. And, and to me, Oscar's definitely got more scope and more potential so i would say he's a he's definitely a potential world champion whether or not he will win that mclaren is another matter and and if he was in a it, it's interesting had he stayed at alpine and not jumped out of the alpine into the mclaren and just gone ahead with the announcement alpine made that he is our race driver alongside esteban ocon right now he'd be in a perfect position to be getting the second Mercedes on a long-term deal alongside George Russell, in which case you could say, yeah, this guy really does have the potential to win a world championship. McLaren, maybe, but it's a big ask for McLaren to go where they are right now to winning a world championship. So I'd say Oscar is one of them. Um, and for sure, Charles Leclerc, for sure, Lewis can still win championships. I think George and Lando probably can. Uh, providing they don't have a guy in the other car who's going to take points from them. So just the Lando situation at McLaren. If George has, um, I don't know, let's say he has Carlos Sainz alongside him, then it'll be quite difficult for George to to score maximum points in every race. I think Carlos will take points from him and vice versa. So they will sort of cancel one another out, if you like. You're talking about world championships. That's why I'm speaking this way. Uh, and I think at Ferrari... Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, it's going to be quite difficult for them, for one of them to have a clear advantage in terms of the points you need to win a championship. That's why always Max has had a guy like Perez in the other car, because it's very rare that Perez actually takes points away from Max, if you see what I mean, on the mm. road. But I'd say Oscar's a guy out there that can really do it. Liam Lawson, if he gets the chance, mm. I think has great car control and great um, he's a brave driver, and I think he's got a lot of feel for racing. He's a real racer, I would say. I, I don't think he's got Oscar's detail, but he's a sort of he's a sort of hard charging Lando, if you like. Um, and, I, and obviously Oliver Berman, in looking at the future, he's very good, a bit George Russellish in the way he drives, but certainly quite capable of winning a championship. And he, a jury's out on. Kimi Antonelli, I think, at the moment, because it's still very early days. But I'm sure Mercedes will try and race him next year. Wait, wait. That's actually very interesting because now that you've mentioned Mercedes, a big fun question has popped up in my mind about the whole driver dynamic. You spoke so well about there being two competitive drivers in one team and the chaos that could solve, rather create for Mercedes, yes. right? If you're Mercedes right now and Lewis Hamilton has just left, what sort of a driver would you want in the team? Someone who's a wingman to George or a proper alpha, quite like Lewis? What would you do? Oh, I would put all my bucket, all my eggs into the George Russell bucket. I'm a great believer in bringing the best out in a guy and, and definitely giving him the confidence he needs to go and do the job. And if you cramp George's style with somebody very quick, it won't get the best from him. In the same way, it didn't get the best from Lewis when they decided to replace Valtteri Bottas with George. And that's why Lewis wanted to keep Bottas. He was the perfect number two, just as Perez is the perfect number two to Max. And as soon as they put George in, it was always going to be an issue there. And had they not done that, interestingly, probably now 
they could look at running Lewis long term and putting Antonelli in the other car and be a really good team. Really good team, Lewis Antonelli, but it's not going to happen. So, yeah, if they put Antonelli in alongside George, that'll bring the best out in George for sure, because he's got this young kid who's never going to be a problem for him in his own mind. So that'll be very good for George. They could run Botas again, you know, <laughs> put in George with Botas would be quite a good team. But I wouldn't put George with, say, Charles Leclerc or George with um, Max or George with, even with Carlos probably would be quite difficult. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see how Kimi Antonelli fares up. But now that you're talking about this story, it reminds me so much of Fernando and then Lewis in 2007 and the chaos that ensued there. Ah, it'll be good times if we see another rookie jump into that Mercedes seat. But I, I really love to touch upon Ferrari here as well, because mm. the whole vibe around the team is suddenly so much better. It's it's different. And you spent some time at the team. You, you know what the proper work ethic and proper culture at Ferrari is like. But it seems like Fred Vasseur is just jumped in and made it sharper, more efficient. What do you think he's changed? And why is that good vibe suddenly back again around Ferrari? Well, Fred is just a logical racer that doesn't speak very much, which is exactly what you want and how you want good racing people to be. Just use your brain, do what's logical and get on with it. Um, as Morris Nunn always said, yeah, Morris Nunn, who ran the Ensign Formula One team, self-starter, built his own cars, did a really good job. He just said, there's no magic. You just use your head and make the right decisions. And he's absolutely right. And, and Fred is doing that. I mean, to me, he's taken quite a long time to get it right, but I suppose it's because it takes quite a long time to get people from one position to another, even within the company these days because of all the restrictions with, with HR and all the rest of it. And then hiring good people from outside always takes a long time because they have to serve out the term of their contract where they are. So everything takes longer, I guess, these days. But it, it's been quite a long time. I mean, all the things he's done, he could, in my view, he could have done in six months. I don't know why it has taken this long. But anyway, there you go. Um, he has got good people. I mean, to me, the big turning point was when uh, he decided to keep Jock Clear and put him on a long-term contract. Because Jock Clear is the sort of guy that, in the, if it was the wrong person running Ferrari, they might get, they might say, oh, well, he's an English engineer. And then the Italians would say, no, we don't really need him. He's not doing a great job. And they would listen to the wrong people. And the next thing you know, Jock's out. But Fred obviously wasn't in any way swayed by that. And that was a clear indication that he would make up his own mind and listen to good logical people and make the right decisions for the right reasons. And that's exactly what he's done. Jock clear a long-term contract. Charles Leclerc likes him. End of story. Make it work. And that's, you know, that's what a good racer does. And that's how Ferrari kind of was when I was there with Cesare Fiorio, although they quickly got blown out of the water by a guy called Castelli, who was the technical director, who, anyway, it's a long story. And, and, and because of all that political mismanagement, it very quickly went downhill. But for a while, for about eight months, it was really working well. And I think Fred's got the ability to keep it going now, for sure. He's a good, good man. And uh, he, as I say, he's got racing in his blood. So he understands good people and how they work and how they operate. I think the decision to replace Carlos with Lewis is a strange one, to be honest. I'm, I'm a bit, still a bit confused by it because Carlos, Charles Carlos, I've always thought was a pretty good team in terms of they're very different in personality. They're different in skill sets. They're pretty good in terms of pretty equal in terms of what they produce. I think Charles is the class driver, but Carlos was getting better all the time. And there was, you know, when things are going well, it just kind of seems unnecessary to break it up. It's a bit like having a nice watch that works well and has never let you down. And then you get a raise at work and you think, oh, I'm going to go and buy a better watch. But it's not a better watch. It's just a different watch that you like the look of. And you don't need to replace the other one. And, and then that's when things get out of sync. It's a bit like Daniel Ricciardo leaving Red Bull for no reason other than that he didn't like getting beaten by Max Verstappen. He walked out of the best team in racing. And I think when Ferrari break up a team combination like Leclerc, Science, because we've got to have Lewis Hamilton, I think it's the wrong reasons to do it because it's... I don't see what Lewis is going to bring to Ferrari. I can see what Ferrari is going to give to Lewis. Absolutely. And if I was Lewis, I'd be doing the same thing. But from Ferrari's point of view, what is it going to bring them that they don't have already? That's what I don't get. And, uh, and because of that, I'm slightly, it's not, it's not that I don't think the Lewis move will work. It's just that that's an indication that things aren't 100% logical at Ferrari 
even today. And maybe that decision came from right from the top from Alcon or somewhere and not from Fred. I don't know. Probably did come from the top because having, having Lewis there does a massive amount for the Ferrari brand globally and the share price and everything else. But from a pure racing point of view, which is what Fred Vasseur is all about, it's not a decision that's completely logical. <laughs> and furthermore, I can't remember a situation ever really where a driver has been told he's going to be fired at the beginning of the year rather than at the end of the year, just before he does get fired. <laughs> it's kind of weird that they're expecting the best from Carlos Sainz all year, a guy they've just decided to fire. It's a very odd situation. And, you know, it's, it's weird. I don't, really, I don't really get why they did that. I'm still confused. Actually, I'd love to confuse you even more. Why do you think they pick Leclerc over Sainz, the only driver who's won a race for them in the last couple of years? Why would they pick the other one to stay in the team? Well, I don't I know, I don't think that's odd. I think if they're deciding that one of them has to go, which again, as I say, is a is an odd decision. I, I don't agree that that is the right decision. I personally don't think that was correct. But if somebody said one of them has to go, in my mind, yeah, it would be science because Leclerc is the class driver. He's a shorter corner driver. He's much better on with a bad car when the tires are graining and when things are going wrong, he's, he's the better driver. He's got a much wider palette on which he can operate. And, and that's great. And Carlos is, Carlos has got a point now that he's reached. He's in a really nice zone, but it's, but it's a zone where if he goes beyond it, it's all to do with reflexes and super late braking and, and all the things that can cause an issue if, if there's a crosswind or if there's something changing in track conditions or if the car's going off in some way. It's, it's more difficult for Carlos to, with, with his scope to be able to live with all of those things. And so technically, in my opinion, Charles is a, is a better driver than Carlos Sainz. But, it's, but as I've said, I think Carlos is absolutely good enough to justify keeping him at Ferrari. And I think you had the best of both worlds with those two drivers. And, but yeah, I would, have, I would have done the same thing. If it was, Peter, you must get rid of one of them. I would have, sadly, I would have said goodbye to Carlos. But I'm not sure I would have done it the way they did because I'd want to keep Carlos confident and happy for a bit longer, you know? Let's just take a quick switch to Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. What do you think is not working for him in 2024? Yes, just three races in, but clearly Yuki, seem to have, Yuki seems to have the measure on him yet in the first three races of the season. Yeah, I, when people were asking me before the season started, what would be the things I'm looking forward to seeing? Um, I said well, the battle between Yuki and Daniel was definitely going to be one of them. And because, I, you know, for me, Yuki's very, very quick. And I knew it was going to be a problem for Daniel. And it was always going to be interesting to see how he faced that problem. And it's no surprise, really, to see that Yuki is on top of him. And it's quite a difficult time already for Daniel. Of course, the real problem is that if you're Daniel Ricciardo and you've worked like a dog all your younger career to get into a Formula One team and eventually you make it to Formula One into the best team in Grand Prix racing, Red Bull racing, with Adrian Newey as the chief engineer and you start winning Grand Prix and then another guy joins the team and he's a bit better than you in a couple of areas and he's obviously going to be difficult to beat but nonetheless if you stay where you are you're still going to win grand prix and you're going to be pretty happy every morning when you wake up and you then walk out of that team because you just can't stand being beaten even if it's not necessarily every race and you go to another team for more money and then you go to another team because they don't want you anymore and then you try somewhere else and then you're out for a while and then you come back with red bull at the back of the red bull list of drivers I'll tell you what that does. That eats away at the heart of what you are all about as a human being. You're no longer this hungry, burning ambition racing driver that above all wants to just be in the best car he can possibly be in to show his talent. You've played around with the gifts that have been given to you. And that's where Daniel is today. He's kind of lost that. He lost that soul of being a pure racing driver the millisecond he decided to leave Red Bull 
And that's when inside his psyche changed. He was no longer the person that he'd been up until that point. And that's what we're seeing today. And no matter how hard he tries to be the super professional driver who's quite experienced now, who has race wins to his credit, who can bring experience to the team in a number of ways, who's a really nice guy, who is a pleasure to be with at any given moment, who the sponsors love, no matter all of that stuff, he isn't the same driver that he was before he decided to leave Red Bull. It's as simple as that. It's a question of human nature. And I don't think he's ever going to get that back because, you know, as Jonathan Wheatley of Red Bull said to Daniel before he left, or as he left Red Bull, he said, Daniel, don't leave. If you stay with us, you're going to win a lot of Grand Prix and you're going to be very successful. Yeah, Max is quicker, but we're going to look after you. No, no, I'm out of here. I can't stand it anymore. Terrible decision by Daniel Ricciardo, in my opinion. Yeah, he's a richer man in terms of his bank account, but not a not a good decision to make. It, it's a decision against the heart and soul of what he was all about. And I know now having had a lot of water pass under the bridge, he's now feeling very refreshed and he's feeling hungry and he wants to get out there and he's got this opportunity and he's going to prove it. The problem is he's got this young, you know, Yuki Sonoda in the other car who is not only super quick, but he's over the last third of 2023, he learned how to bring a car home and score points on a regular basis. And that's what he's still doing, driving really well in the races. And it's very easy for people to write off Yoki and say, oh, you know, he's quick, but he's a bit wild. He's not wild. He's very, very good. He's very good. And 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 I don't think Daniel knows how to beat him. That's the problem. That's very well summarized. I remember when Daniel Ricciardo made his moves, they were the headline driver moves those years, moving away from Red Bull to Renault and then Renault to McLaren. And then, of course, being dropped by McLaren, as, as we all know. But the mm. other headline driver move that's happening is Lewis Hamilton. But clearly, he is struggling this season in that Mercedes. What do you think has gone wrong, Peter? Well, clearly, George is struggling in the Mercedes as well, if he can't even pass Fernando Alonso in an Aston Martin around Melbourne. I mean, this is a team that's won, I mean, I don't know, I've lost track of how many world championships they won recently. They've got all the facilities, all the money, all the people, everything in the world, biggest they can possibly have. And they're getting beaten by two of their three customer teams. It's pathetic. So it's not just Lewis. I mean, I, when you've got a car, it's obviously still very difficult to drive. But they, they haven't done over the winter what Ferrari have done, which is taken top speed out of the car, added downforce in an efficient way to get the tyres much more manageable and give them the drivers much more opportunity to, to show their ability, uh, which what Ferrari have done. Mercedes tried to do that and have quite clearly not succeeded. And they've still got a car, but if they take the wing off the car they, in which to have a reasonable top speed, the car's on an absolute knife edge on anything approaching a medium or high speed corner. And high speed oversteer is not something that I would imagine Lewis Hamilton with seven world championships behind him and all that road dust is going to necessarily embrace if he's doing it for to finish sixth in a Grand Prix. Why would he? I wouldn't. I mean, anyone with a racing brain would know that Lewis isn't going to put his put his neck out the way George Russell will for one lap with white knuckles, absolutely on the edge. Why does Lewis need to do that? If it's for the pole, yeah, obviously he will. But for P six, P five, or something, <laughs> forget it. And that's um, you know that's totally understandable. And I think anybody that imagines that Lewis today would be putting it out on the edge the way he did in 2007, 2008 is doesn't know much about racing. You know, doesn't understand the sport or human beings really. But I think Lewis is doing a really good job overall. Um, but I think he's obviously massively disappointed yet again that the car isn't a race winner. A and B, he's got the Ferrari contract in his pocket. He's already thinking about pasta and red cars and an island called Sardinia where he might buy a house. I have no idea. All the things that come with driving for Ferrari. And he's, he's looking forward to that. He's relaxed. No longer is he that worried about all the frenetic George Russell white knuckle stuff that, you know, has been going on. Mercedes didn't fight hard enough, I think, after Abu Dhabi 21 to, re to, to redress the balance there. They, they hired George Russell when Lewis wanted to keep Valtteri. And they've given Lewis a very bad car for the last ever since. So it's no surprise that he just wants to get out of that place now. I'm surprised he's stuck at this long, to be honest, at Mercedes. 
You also mentioned, you know, the George Russell's inability to pass Fernando Alonso, given how bad the Mercedes is this year. Mm. Very interesting. But what do you make of the Fernando Alonso and George Russell incident from the last race in Australia? Well, it definitely wasn't a brake test. And so the penalty that they gave Fernando, which was for brake testing, should not have been applied, I don't think. Having said that, if that is the correct penalty for brake testing, and I should reiterate here, I don't think that was brake testing, then the penalty is a complete joke because brake testing is about the most dangerous thing you can do in Formula One. It is the most dangerous thing you can do in Formula One. And if anybody's ever caught by telemetry brake testing another driver, that I, in my opinion, they should be excluded from the world championship and they should be banned for three races, five races maybe, not, not given a 20-second penalty. But Having said all of that, I don't think Fernando was brake testing George, I, but I do think he was faffing around trying to sort of unsettle George and doing what Fernando does sometimes and being a bit clever and going into the corner a bit slower and trying to slow him down at the apex and then getting on the power and trying to get a gap from him, which is kind of, it's okay. You know, there's nothing in the sporting rules as I know that say so you can't do that. And George... I imagine has done his homework and knows that Fernando has done that in the past in, in various situations. If he hasn't done his homework, he should have known that and should have predicted that Fernando might be trying something like that. Or if George hadn't, certainly some of the Mercedes engineers on the radio to George should have been saying that to, to George, but I'm not sure they were because uh, I'm not sure that many of them care about the history of the sport that much. But there's a good example of when some people say, uh, and I do quite a lot of live streams, and, and not so long ago I had a, a, a viewer said, Peter, it's 2024, stop talking about 1986 or something like that. And I, I was quite upset about that because th we're standing on the shoulders today of all the people that did what they did in 1986, and they're standing on the shoulders of what everybody did in 1958. So you can't, you actually forget about history at your peril. And that was a very good example. If the engineers had been on to George saying, George, remember Imola, Michael and Fernando, remember what, he, remember what he was doing to Michael, remember what that race was all about, be ready for Fernando to do something a bit weird going into a, a slower corner, maybe that, wouldn't, that accident wouldn't have happened. But I wonder whether the engineers were saying that. I doubt it. Because I think today the drivers and the engineers live in a sort of bubble of operation and the rules define what you can and cannot do. And they just assume that everybody's going to drive within those rules. But a driver like Fernando has got so much skill and he's so imaginative that even on the edge of the rules, he can find little gray areas of flexibility that still allow him to be Fernando Alonso and keep you know, a car like an Aston ahead of a Mercedes, a factory Mercedes. And that's exactly what he was doing. As it happened, he kind of messed it up, didn't he, in that corner? He, he, as By his own admission, it was kind of unusual for Fernando, by, by his own admission, he made a mistake. He actually went in a bit slower than he really wanted to, so he actually had to accelerate again. But even so, it's his bit of road. He's the guy in front. He can kind of do whatever he likes there. He's not changing direction, which the rules say you can't do. He's not brake testing because it's not flat out in top gear. So he can kind of do that if he wants to. So it's not nothing wrong. And it just could discombobulated George and he lost focus and went, and went off. Very weird, really, to be honest. And I just think George should have had a slightly bigger sweet spot in which he was operating, bigger margin for error, given that it was Fernando he was following. Yeah, interesting. You know, for attacking, you have so many options, especially the DRS. But when it comes to defending, the drivers are pretty much wanting to be treated as sitting ducks, especially if you go by how the FIA dealt with this situation, you know, drove dangerously, can't slow in appropriately and all of that. So I'm hoping that as we go to uh, the next few rounds, the drivers and the FIA are able to talk because what we essentially want, Peter, if I go back to the 80s again, and I love reliving those as well, is we want wheel to wheel battles, right? We want drivers in battle engaged where we don't know who's going to come out on top. What what the, the metric in today's age is how many overtakes have happened. All people care about is has the driver behind driven past the driver ahead. They don't really care how he's done that. So I'm hoping that that's also something that changes as the regulations change in 2026, where you're you know giving drivers enough of a chance to battle rather than be seen as sitting ducks, right? But switching 
2 formula 2 peter assuming you also follow formula 2 given that you've watched bit. a lot of yeah a lot of sport indian formula 2 driver kush maini has taken formula 2 by storm you know two pole positions almost in the first two rounds podium finishes he's been leading the races he's been doing different things on track has he impressed you and in in what he's doing with his performances this year oh definitely got a lot of time for kush uh, i've known of him for quite a long time because i'm good friends with a guy called matt cowley who's very talented young english driver who i met racing ford 1600 actually at the formula ford festival about five years ago uh, and he just does Formula Ford uh, just for the fun of it. But he is a very fast racing driver. He's doing GT racing now in the UK. And he um, he works for a company in at Silverstone, which is a sim company, basically. And and Kush was always there with him every day. And they're very close friends. And they just used to race one another all the time. So I would, I would ring Matt and say, oh, yeah, beat Kush today. Or Kush would F3 and F2, the trouble to interview him. And I always thought he had very good car control and... And, and and the right approach, to be honest. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> I think Kush is really good. I think he's got a very good management team behind him. He's managed by the same people that manage Pierre Gasly, uh, based in the UK, very good operation. He's got good people there. And, yeah, I think a lot of people stand to take him very, <clears throat> excuse me, very seriously, and that's a good thing. Too many good Indian drivers have not had the opportunity to show their talent. I think um, Jahan Darubala is much better than a Formula E drive deserves, to be honest. I think he should have been given an opportunity. And I find it extraordinary that Formula One, a Formula One team, didn't just give him a proper chance on merit, as distinct from the association he had with Force India, uh, because he's good enough. You know, you see guys like um, Guan Yajou out there doing a pretty good job in the Sauber, but yeah, there wasn't a lot between, um, say, Jehan and Guan Yajou in Formula 2. I think maybe, uh, probably Guan Yajou was in a slightly better team. But at the time, they were pretty closely matched. And, and it wasn't as if Jehan didn't win F2 races. He did. And, 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 and just to see him not being given an opportunity is a big worry. And, and that shouldn't happen. And I feel embarrassed in a way that Formula One has let that happen. So I hope that with Kush, he is given a real opportunity and is taken seriously because he's a very talented driver. And the way he recovered from that setback in Bahrain when he took the pole and he's put on the back of the grid, he drove really well. And then he was just on it again, you know, in Saudi Arabia. And that shows a lot of strength of character as well. Hopefully there are more occasions for us to relish his talent as well. But it's been a lovely hour of chatting about Formula yeah. 1 with you, Peter. Honestly, it, it didn't even feel like 60 minutes. It's just flown by. And thank you so much for taking out the time on, what is it now? A, a Monday afternoon, is it now? No, t a Tuesday morning. Time flies. It's Tuesday morning here in Spain. Yeah, lovely morning. Blue sky, sun <laughs> shining. Uh, just about to go and take the dog for a walk. Exactly. Sounds like a perfect day. But seriously, thank you so much for your time, Peter. Pleasure. And it was amazing to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. Before we ended, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Amazon Music once again for partnering with us on this episode of the podcast.